So welcome everybody uh, to this webinar hosted by Chatham House on perspectives on nuclear deterrence in the 21st century. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all. Uh, we have speakers from many different countries in many different time zones and I understand that that's true for our audience as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. 75 years ago, the nuclear weapon was used for the first two times and hopefully the last two times in conflict. The US bombed the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, destroying uh, large numbers of people and uh, infrastructure within the city with one weapon. This changed the world and the way the world looks at conflict. It uh, formed very much part of the Cold War that followed. And the concept of nuclear deterrence was developed in which countries that possess nuclear weapons or were in alliances with those with nuclear weapons felt that this was the ultimate way to deter war. This has been a highly contested uh, set of values and set of principles for deterrence in which others uh, claim that nuclear weapons create a, a very difficult framework for negotiation, a very difficult framework for international relations and are far too dangerous um, for uh, their contemplated use on which nuclear deterrence depends. Chatham House um, a few weeks ago published a paper looking again at the underlying issues of nuclear deterrence and we're delighted to have some of uh, our contributors to that paper with us here today to speak as on a panel. Before turning to the panel, um, we are extremely fortunate to have with us Governor Hideko Hiko Yuzaki, who is the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. Um, and I'm going to invite the governor to say a few words now to open up our meeting before I turn to the panel. So, uh, Governor Yuzaki, I, I turn to you now to open up our meeting and, and bring us greetings from the city and the prefecture of Hiroshima. Well, thank you, Patricia. And uh, good morning and good day and good evening, depending where you are. Hello from Hiroshima. I'm Hidehiko Yuzaki, the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. Well, it's a great pleasure to participate here in this webinar on the very important topic of nuclear deterrence. Well, you all know that this year marks 75th, 75 years uh, since the first use in the war of a nuclear weapon in the world. Well, after 75 years, even though no country formally opposes the goal of abolition, abolishing nuclear weapons, well, uh, recently, uh, no practical progress has been seen in nuclear disarmament. To ensure that nations are seriously committed uh, to the elimination of nuclear weapons, discrediting the enigmatic nuclear deterrent theory, the primary rationale for the reliance on nuclear weapons is of vital importance. Well, nuclear, uh, the deterrence theory that is deterring attacks from enemies by possessing nuclear weapons is merely an idea shared and believed by people and in fact a fiction as Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari put, put it. So it will lose its legitimacy as well as its efficacy if everybody stops believing it. To put it in a different way, uh, people have the ability to change the theory. No matter how hard it seems, the national security system relying on nuclear weapons can be changed because nuclear deterrence theory is only a fiction. Well, tensions are increasing in Northeast and South Asia, but no adequate scrutiny seems to have been conducted during the long period of time after the end of the Cold War to confirm whether the assumptions underpinning the de deterrence theory fit the current reality of the world. Through the collaborative research of Hiroshima Prefecture with Chatham House, 
conducted in recent years, it has become clear that significant issues exist regarding nuclear deterrence in four aspects. One, the assumptions underpinning the implementation of nuclear deterrence. But two, the per, uh, perpetual value of extended deterrence. Three, influence from the emergence of new technologies. And four, the blurred boundary between conventional weapons and nuclear weapons. Well, nuclear deterrence theory is based on truly uncertain assumptions with technological innovation and geopolitical factors bringing into question any future prospect that deterrence will continue to prevent nuclear war. In these circumstances, we can no longer allow ourselves to stop thinking critically or to depend on nuclear deterrence theory without any doubts. Well, Paul Francis came last year to Hiroshima, and as he suggested during his speech, mankind's departure from nuclear deterrent theory requires wisdom collected from all over the world and action taken by all countries and all people. The usage of nuclear weapons would not only greatly affect military targets, but also civilians living in close proximity. Uh, furthermore, the radioactivity and climate change brought by an A-bomb could negatively impact all humans, flora and fauna on Earth. Everyone on Earth is a stakeholder in this persistent issue, and we need to generate powerful momentum towards the abolishment of nuclear weapons by invoking the engagement of not only the community of specialists on disarmament and security, but as many people as possible, connecting it to other global issues such as climate change, communi uh, communicable diseases as we see now, and fair and sustainable development. Well, regrettably, the elimination of nuclear weapons has not been accomplished during the past 75 years, once described as the period when no plants would grow in Hiroshima. We must take this fact ser seriously and renew our pledge to abolish nuclear weapons as soon as possible while A-bomb victims are still alive. I'd like to emphasize that we need to share wisdom and take actions now before the future generations blame us for inaction and responsibility. Well, today's webinar will be a very important and precious opportunity for us to directly listen to specialist views on those significant issues regarding nuclear deterrence. And I'm looking uh, very much forward to the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you indeed, uh, Governor, for those opening remarks and reminding us of the, of the uh, significance and importance and the difficulties in discussing uh, these issues. I'm going to now open up the panel. Um, and um, for those of you in the audience, um, please feel that this is a very interactive discussion. We have a Q&A function. Um, if you type your name into the Q&A function with your question, um, I can call on you uh, in the Q&A part, in the discussion part. Um, if you would prefer that I would read out your question, uh, you can write that also. So please uh, feel free to uh, put some questions in, put some comments in, and I'll try to get to as many of you as I possibly can in, in the discussion. So I'm going to turn, first of all, to Jessica Cox, who is the Director of Nuclear Policy Directorate at NATO. Jessica. Thank you so much for the invitation and opportunity to say a few words. Uh, about NATO's nuclear deterrent capabilities and policies. Nuclear weapons have been a core component of NATO's overall capabilities for deterrence and defense since its inception 75 years ago. As heads of state and government have reaffirmed on many occasions, the fundamental purpose of NATO's nuclear capabilities are to preserve peace, prevent coercion, and deter aggression. NATO also remains committed to arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation as a key contributor to strategic stability and regional security. This includes bolstering existing regimes and expanding arms control regimes 
beyond the European theater. And while my remarks are not going to be focused on arms control today, I'm happy to get to some of our thinking in the, in the Q&A. NATO is taking steps now to continue to ensure that our deterrence and defense posture can address the full range of threats to the alliance, taking into account changes to the evolving international security environment. Most significantly, this includes taking steps to ensure the continued credibility and effectiveness of our nuclear deterrent in response to Russia's growing nuclear weapons stockpile and diversification of its delivery systems. This includes its deployment of a new intermediate range missiles in Europe, its investment in short range and dual capable missile systems, its growing stockpile of non-strategic nuclear weapons, and its development of hypersonic systems, including the Avangard and Sarkhan, uh, which it's been testing and, and deploying uh, on, as well as its new air launch ballistic missile system, uh, and tests of its uh, unmanned nuclear torpedo and nuclear powered nuclear armed cruise missile. These, are, these systems and these developments are ca causing increasing concern among allies that uh, regional stability uh, is no longer, um, be, that our deterrence is no longer effective and that we may uh, be called upon um, to take steps in response to these developments. And what we're doing today is looking broadly across the capabilities of the Alliance to adapt our exercises, to increase our intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, to look to adapt our theater, air and missile defenses, and to bolster our conventional capabilities. And we're also taking steps to ensure that our nuclear deterrent will remain safe, secure, and effective. This includes defensive steps that will maintain the credibility of our nuclear infrastructure and forces with a focus on the resilience of our dual capable aircraft capabilities. This, will, this includes steps to ensure that Russia will never, uh, can never believe that they could use their intermediate range cruise missiles or other systems to undermine allied unity or control escalation in a crisis. We are taking steps to further improve NATO's nuclear decision-making capabilities to ensure a timely and effective response to any nuclear threats. And we're continuing to enhance our nuclear command and control and communications resiliency and effectiveness against modern challenges and future threats. These defensive steps are focused on the continued survivability, responsiveness, and effectiveness of our nuclear deterrent. And it is also important to reiterate what NATO is not doing in response. NATO does not seek an arms race, and we will not mirror Russia's behavior or its capability development. As the Secretary General has stated many times, NATO allies have no intention of deploying new land-based nuclear missiles in Europe. And that is, that is a, a, a agreed a principle from, from the allies. Furthermore, NATO remains committed to the key principles of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, and is not considering any changes to our nuclear posture that would be against its provisions. So in the interest of time, because I only have five minutes, let me stop there and I look forward to your questions and to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica, uh, for a very clear and within time uh, uh, presentation. Um, may I now turn to uh, Dr. Nikolai Sokov, who is at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Nikolai. Oh, thank you, Patricia. Um, I will say that the previous presentation was uh, truly fascinating because uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but I do feel young now. Uh, <laughs> and it sounds like uh, those days like in the 80s when I was young and was just actually starting on the arms control track. Uh, when we talk about the Russian perspective, I'll do uh, just a very, very brief kind of note on that. Uh, it's important to understand uh, that Russian so attitude to nuclear deterrence is very traditional and very conservative. And so Russia is fundamentally uh, within the same theoretical framework as it emerged back in the 60s. Um, uh, even that is like an innovation uh, because uh, during the Soviet time, uh, the very notion of deterrence actually was 
well, uh, did not exist officially. Uh, yeah, Soviet leadership completely kind of rejected it uh, for ideological reasons and political reasons. And only in the 90s, the Russian military really started to introduce uh, just the theory of deterrence. Uh, I wanted uh, uh, to commend Chatham House on an excellent, very interesting publication, very timely publication, uh, because the issues of associated with nuclear deterrence are extremely uh, challenging and are very important because I'm sorry to say that, but nuclear weapons are here to stay for a long time. Uh, and uh, the reason for having nuclear weapons is not so much simply the fact that other states have nuclear weapons, but because they have all other missions as well. Uh, so the most timely issues, uh, the most challenging issues as well, is, is the relationship between nuclear weapons and uh, other modes of hostile action, such as conventional weapons or conventional forces, or, or, or new technologies or the emerging technologies and activities uh, that do not represent war, that are below the threshold of war. Uh, and specifically, I think the most interesting kind of question to ask is where uh, nuclear weapons apply? Uh, where do you draw the line? Also, uh, nuclear weapons apply here, but they don't feature all, 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 mm, in this part of the continuum. Uh, I would say that uh, the blurring of nuclear and conventional uh, weapons is not new. Well, in fact, it has existed uh, from the early days uh, of the nuclear era. These nuclear weapons have uh, all, always been associated uh, with deterring conventional attack. Uh, that's really NATO policy throughout uh, uh, the Cold War. Uh, what happened with the end of the Cold War is that roles actually switched. Yes, and today, uh, we talk about the Russian escalate, uh, today escalate strategy, but fundamentally, uh, basically, you know, all, all look at a conceptual level, it's the same that NATO did during the Cold War. Yes, and NATO today uh, talks about nuclear weapons as being separate and special, uh, much in the same way that the Soviet Union used to talk about nuclear weapons uh, being special. So what changed? Uh, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union did have an opportunity uh, uh, did have the capability to wage and win conventional war. Uh, today, NATO does have that capability. Oh, yes, at least that's a very firm conviction in Moscow and uh, 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 that's how they operate. So the interesting question is not about the blurring per se between nuclear and conventional, but how that blurring uh, is uh, operating uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, yes, and there are some differences. For example, uh, during the Cold War, NATO primarily relied on short-range uh, tactical uh, 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 to maximum uh, the intermediate range uh, nuclear weapons uh, to deter uh, the Russian conventional capability. And by extension, everyone talks today about Russian reliance on tactical nuclear weapons. But in fact, back in 2003, actually Russia said that since NATO relies on long range conventional capability, uh, then Russia should rely on long range nuclear capability. Uh, to deter that. Uh, there isn't really uh, a, a lot uh, of role uh, of, of for tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, the second important point is how far that continuum uh, does go. In fact, the book does postulate uh, things about so, so, all hybrid warfare, or the Gerasimov doctrine, uh, yes, it implies, uh, one of the chapters implies that uh, that's how, uh, well, in fact, Russia conceptualizes nuclear weapons, and I don't think that's exactly uh, co completely correct. Uh, well, in fact, the term hybrid warfare and the whole concept was invented 
in the United States. Uh, and in fact, uh, the whole application of, of, of actions of, of below the level of war is to avoid the situation when you have to use military force and have to rely on nuclear weapons. So we do need to very clearly define where nuclear deterrence applies and where it doesn't. Uh, so I think the book is an important step uh, in the direction of understanding uh, what's happening with nuclear weapons and their roles today. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would be actually happy uh, to discuss certain aspects in more detail if there is interest, uh, uh, but I think this work should uh, be continued and I'm really glad that Chatham House uh, takes the initiative there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nikolai, and thank you also for sticking within time. I'm now going to turn to uh, Dr. Tang Zhao, who's at the Carnegie Xinghao Center uh, for Global Policy. Tang Zhao, please. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I want to apologize first for the noise in my background. There is some construction work in my building. And I want to uh, congratulate uh, Chatham House for the excellent report on 21st century nuclear deterrence, which provides a very comprehensive and insightful analysis on this topic. In my initial remarks, I would like to offer a few brief thoughts on Chinese views of nuclear deterrence. Uh, firstly, uh, I think China has an interesting view about the risk of conflict escalation, uh, both below the nuclear threshold and above the nuclear threshold. It has been pointed out by, uh, ex by experts that uh, China thinks um, a conventional conflict is very hard to escalate uh, across the nuclear threshold. Uh, but once uh, the nuclear threshold is crossed, uh, the nuclear conflict would escalate very quickly and all the way uh, to an all-out uh, nuclear, nuclear war. There won't be any uh, middle steps uh, after the nuclear threshold is crossed, uh, which is very different from the mainstream view in many Western countries. I think the result of this interesting uh, perception is China tends to dismiss uh, the risk of uh, nuclear escalation of conventional conflict. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, China tends to view other countries' efforts uh, to control and manage nuclear escalation as either, uh, as either crazy or as an excuse uh, to uh, develop uh, nuclear counter force capabilities. Uh, so we have to recognize the existence of an uh, important perception gap between China and many uh, Western countries. Uh, maybe a future dialogue to delve deeper on these, uh, uh, on these different perceptions can help us better understand each other's view and, uh, and come up with options to uh, jointly uh, mitigate uh, risk of conflict both uh, below the nuclear threshold and above the nuclear threshold. A uh, second point is about the impact of new technologies. Uh, many people agree new technologies could affect the stability of deterrence relationship. One important example is the introdu introduction of uh, dual capable weapons, weapons that can be armed with either nuclear warhead or conventional warhead. Uh, in many countries, including China, uh, they are developing uh, dual-capable uh, missiles and other weapon system. In the Chinese case, we have DF-26 uh, ballistic missile. Uh, there, ha there has been, you know, China has developed uh, such dual-capable weapons without a clear understanding about their potential escalation risks because such weapons uh, could uh, cause misunderstandings, especially during crisis, uh, and especially uh, if countries adopt a launch under attack postures. There has been uh, growing awareness within China about the risk uh, coming from deal-capable weapons, but the awareness is not sufficient, is not deep or broad enough to bring about necess necessary policy change to address this challenge. So maybe some joint examination uh, of uh, the main powers uh, to explore and, uh, deep, uh, and uh, examine the risks of deal-capable weapons 
can help uh, can help uh, uh, better build awareness of the risks and find potential uh, solutions. And of course, looking into the future, uh, one question facing us is whether uh, we should allow countries to develop dual capable hypersonic missiles. Uh, given their uh, capability to maneuver, they introduce even greater risks of misunderstanding and inadvertent escalation. Uh, so we'd better make a decision right now uh, before those uh, capabilities are uh, deployed. Uh, last point I want to make is, I believe, one eternal challenge for stable deterrence relationship is how to decide uh, who is provoking, uh, who is the aggressor, uh, who tries to change the status quo, and who uh, is the status quo power, who tries to uh, preserve uh, status quo. Uh, in the case of uh, China, um, if you read, uh, if you look at the U.S.-China nuclear relationship, for example, U.S. is uh, emphasizing low-yield tactical nuclear weapons as a response uh, to perceived uh, Russian uh, escalate to de-escalate uh, strategy. But from the Chinese perspective, we believe the U.S. is deliberately uh, building up nuclear warfighting capabilities and, and to intentionally lower the threshold of nuclear use by uh, emphasizing low-yield technical nuclear capabilities. So we see the U.S. as the, uh, as the one that provokes and, and takes uh, a more aggressive nuclear posture. And so this perception gap can cause serious misunderstanding. Um, and in the case of Australia, as another example, uh, Australia in its new defense policy wants to uh, develop more independent strike capabilities uh, and sees that as necessary uh, for self-defense. But for, from the Chinese view, Australia wants to help the United States contain China uh, and to better contribute to a US-led military coalition against China. So there is a huge perception gap about who is changing the status quo and who is defending the status quo. That's, I think that presents the greatest threat uh, for countries to maintain their stable deterrence relationship. I think first, we need to recognize the existence of such perception gap. There is no such recognition yet. And I think more exchanges like this uh, could be very important to build basic common understandings. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tom Chan. And again, thank you for sticking to time. We appear to have temporarily lost our next speaker, Tanya Ogilvie White. So what I thought I'd do is I'd just um, ask each of the panelists to answer my question, and then um, hopefully Tanya will be back on. If not, we'll go into the broader discussion. So. 25 years ago, it was the 50th anniversary of the use of nuclear weapons. Um, and 25 years ago, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, was extended indefinitely. Um, where do you think we might be in another 25 years, if we can look ahead? Do you, in this panel, imagine a world in which nuclear disarmament has taken hold, that we'd be either rid of these nuclear weapons or on the pathway to that? Do you envisage a world in which many more states have nuclear weapons and are also uh, you know, embedding that concept of nuclear deterrence? Or do you imagine that more or less the status quo will hold for another 25 years? So if I could turn to each of our panelists who are, who are on the line, who would like to go first? Nobody wants to answer my question. <laughs> Jessica. I'll good. take a first you. step. Um, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's quite difficult to, you know, always to do predictive analysis and, and think about where we'll be in 25 years. Um, I think from my personal perspective, I think the next 10 years are going to be very difficult. I think the trends are all in a very um, negative direction. Uh, I think that um, the, the buildup that we're seeing, the, the reliance more on nuclear weapons uh, is, is increasing, not decreasing. Um, and, and I think that there's such a reservoir of mistrust, I think uh, Tom Chow just highlighted, between many of the actors that it's going to be very difficult uh, to overcome 
and to really change, uh, change the dynamics in, in the shorter term. Um, that said, I, you know, to, to be a bit more optimistic, I think that there are a lot of people that, uh, I, don't, I don't foresee a future where there's a big nuclear breakout, where there's a, a large proliferation of, of nuclear weapons to new actors and new states. Um, I, I think the, the norm against um, both uh, nuclear proliferation and nuclear use is quite strong. Um, and I think that uh, I, I'm not somebody who thinks that you know, nuclear war is right around the corner. So I think that if anything, we'll be much more in a kind of status quo situation um, than, than one where things have changed significantly one way or the other. That said, if you look at um, you know, how quickly things could change for either the positive or, or the negative, you know, there's, there's tremendous opportunities there as well. So you know, if you look at you know, the situation between 1975 and 1985 and how significantly things have changed or between 1985 and 1995, I mean, there, there can be very significant shifts uh, in positive directions very quickly too, where you have leaders who are committed to change, are committed to taking drastic and dramatic steps. So I think it's, it, we, we're in a position right now where the trend lines are in a negative direction, um, but I don't think they're so negative that the, that the world is, is going to be completely terrible in 25 years. At the other, on the other hand, I think that things could change dramatically for the better if there's real commitment um, by, by world leaders, particularly in the P5, the whole P5, to, to making positive steps. Thank you very much. Actually, I, um, there was a question in the um, Q&A um, from uh, Jolien Pretorius um, asking, what is NATO doing to create the environment for nuclear disarmament? And on self-reflection, what is it not doing? I think you've partway answered that. Perhaps you could just give us a few thoughts on what you think NATO could be doing more than it's doing right now. Sure, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult for NATO as, a, as an organization um, to say that we are or aren't doing things for, for nuclear disarmament. I mean, the, the P5 and the, the other nuclear powers are the ones that, that really have to, have to take steps. And what NATO does do is have, play a, a very strong coordinating function among the P3. Um, we have a lot of internal discussions about uh, how we can collectively um, strengthen arms control regimes, how we can strengthen the NPT. Um, we are actively working on um, doing some internal thinking about how we can look at um, new arms control measures for um, missile regimes to bolster both existing missile regimes and look at new ideas and, and new, um, new um, you, you know, things that, things that we can do. But from a, from a disarmament perspective, as opposed to an arms control perspective, I mean, this is, a disarmament is something that is squarely within the, within the purview of, of the P5. And I think that from a NATO perspective, we have been very supportive of steps um, from the P3 uh, NATO nations to um, reduce nuclear arsenals within the European theater. The number of nuclear weapons uh, in Europe has been reduced by um, about 90% since the, since the end of the Cold War. So we've, we've gone, you know, taken significant steps already. Uh, and I think that, you know, NATO continues to look at steps towards disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation, and, and things that we can do to just foster a, a more productive environment. Um, and we uh, also, you know, think that it is very important to continue to foster dialogue. Um, NATO allies are very supportive of the new, uh, or the renewed US-Russia strategic stability talks. Um, we are very, um, uh, supportive of bringing China into arms control in some way, shape, or form. Uh, both the UK and France have been very clear that they're not going to expand their nuclear arsenals and that, they're, that their arsenals are steady. So I think that there is a lot of things that, that NATO has done and that we are, you know, and the, that we have been doing and will continue to do into the future. But a lot of it is 
isn't you know big public splashy declarations. It's a lot of work inside the alliance to um, build common positions, to have discussions, to think through what is in uh, in the security interest of allies and, and of uh, the Euro-Atlantic area, uh, and to really foster um, uh, dialogue and uh, and create uh, you know the environment for where the the P5 can can take steps in the future. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. Now um, I know that Nikolai is prepared to answer my question, but I think I might just go out to the floor and then Nikolai, if you can incorporate your answer in, into that, that would be really great. Um, I know that um, Oliver Mayer has a question. Um, so Oliver, if you could answer, ask your question, and if I could bring in Gareth Evans as well uh, with his question, because they, they are connected, I think. So if we could go first to um, Oliver Mayer and then to Gareth Evans, that would be great. Yeah, thanks very much. I hope, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, my uh, question also goes to Jessica Cox, um, and um, it also looks into the future, though not uh, 25 years. Uh, NATO has begun um, a reflection process looking at NATO in 2030, and I'd be interested to hear uh, from Jessica um, to what degree NATO will also be looking at its nuclear posture and nuclear sharing arrangements. Um, in that context, for example, we have a debate now, a lively debate on a no first use. Uh, would that be uh, something that NATO is willing uh, to look at um, with regard to the nuclear weapons assigned to the alliance? Thanks very much. Uh, before you answer that, Jessica, we'll go to Gareth. And then I realize that I've unfortunately, unwittingly just put Jessica on the spot, which isn't fair. So I will also uh, call on uh, Orion Noda to, uh, for, and I will read his question out at, at the end. So then you can answer three questions together. So Gareth, please. I wanted to focus also on no first use on the basis that probably that's the best circuit breaker, both in terms of regenerating momentum towards disarmament generally, and also just just moving the game forward uh, in a way that Obama, of course, tried uh, with a personal commitment, intellectual commitment to uh, sole purpose, but was stymied by opposition from East European NATO allies and Northeast Asian allies. Uh, Russia's probably a lost cause in that respect, and Nikolai might want to comment on that. But is the United States now a lost cause, or can that momentum be regenerated uh, under a Biden administration? Uh, I don't know whether NATO institutionally can help the game to move forward, but it really was very, very depressing for all of us, particularly in East Asia and Australia, to see the, uh, the absolute unwillingness to move down that particular no first use uh, doctrinal path. Under the, uh, under, under the Obama administration, and I hope we can uh, reverse that. What's, what's the view as to the possibility of that? Thank you, Gareth. And then um, Orion Noda um, wants me to read the question out loud. Question, and particularly for Nikolai, but I think that there are others as well. On the purposes of nuclear weapons, aside from deterrence and other states having nuclear weapons, so how can we tackle them to dismantle the idea that nuclear weapons are here to stay and we have to live with them. So I think that, you know, we're seeing a, a theme come through her of, you know, where are we going? We, I think this is the bigger picture that people need to have, it's a, a sense of direction of travel rather than this is, it is what it is, we are where we are, which I think is characterizing the debate very much. It's where, where we're going with us that people really want to get to grips with. So if I could turn perhaps to Nikolai and then Tong and then back to Jessica. Oh, yes. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, the question, uh, so yes, I just need to clarify. When I said uh, all the all the weapons are going uh, to stay with us, uh, uh, that was not a happy note. I actually don't like it <laughs> at all. Yes, I, it's a sad note. Uh, uh, so the missions about nuclear weapons, that's about what I actually mentioned. Well, in fact, the primary mission of nuclear weapons or rather one of two primary missions of nuclear weapons is in fact uh, to deter conventional forces that are superior. Uh, yes, and this is uh, uh, still here with us. Uh, all the context, well, the conditions uh, are changing like a little bit. Uh, uh, so that mission was emphasized by NATO, now emphasized by Russia. But an important thing uh, to note here is that unfortunately we do not pay of sufficient attention to that. 
Yes, I fully appreciate uh, that NATO prefers to emphasize conventional, actually, forces in conventional response uh, to the perceived Russian threat. Uh, uh, what that policy does miss is uh, that Russia actually treats NATO conventional capability as more dangerous than its nuclear capability because conventional is so usable. Uh, so we'll see a counter response uh, to Russia. And the bad thing here, actually the worst thing here, is that there is not enough dialogue. Uh, well, in fact, both uh, sides uh, say about the same things. Uh, yes, I fully appreciate uh, uh, what Jessica Cox said about uh, the efforts of NATO uh, uh, to maintain the foster dialogue. Yes, and Russia is saying exactly the same thing but the dialogue is not there, uh, nonetheless. Worse, if you actually look at what happened to the INF Treaty, uh, uh, the possibilities uh, to resolve that issue were not used in full by both sides. Uh, well, I think it's a shame, in fact, well, it's complete shame uh, that uh, the first time uh, the two parties had a substantive dialogue on INF was under Trump. It was in December uh, 2017, the first time that it was really like in depth. Uh, so will uh, Biden, uh, oh, so I'm jumping, uh, well, just like in the interest of time. Uh, so will Biden, in fact, be able to restore the dialogue? I don't know. Uh, the political atmosphere is way too poisonous, in fact, for a serious dialogue. And once again, uh, well, it's completely kind of terrible. It's very shocking. Uh, but uh, we now have consultations, like in Vienna, already uh, two rounds of interagency, very in-depth. Well, of course, positions of the parties are extremely kind of different. And uh, yeah, but at least they discuss those kind of differences. Yes, and they, oh, they discuss that in depth, and we have not had that since the conclusion of New Start. Yes, unfortunately, uh, that uh, our dialogue is associated with Trump, who is considered a like, Moscow stooge and things like that. I don't really know whether politically, in fact, Biden will be able to engage in the same thing. Uh, we do need dialogue and we do need to pay very close attention to the relationship between nuclear and conventional. We don't talk about that much, but in my view, that's the main driver. Uh, and uh, well, it's not to say that we have an arms race in Europe. We got several of them uh, that go all at the same time and hand by hand. We do not have a big so, uh, uh, during the Cold War, we feared so, uh, uh, so, look at World War III. Uh, oh yes, and that's why the two sides were extremely kind of cautious uh, to avoid provoking that. Unfortunately, I think the probability of a small-scale, low-level conflict is significantly higher today uh, than it used to be during the Cold War, uh, but those low-level, small-scale conflicts so, so always uh, carry with them the risk of escalation. And uh, I, well, to be honest, uh, yes, I'm more concerned uh, today than I was even like in the 80s. Uh, Thank you. Well, I've never been as concerned since 1983, I must tell you honestly. That's a very um, disturbing note um, to turn now to Dr. Ovi White, Tony Ovi White, who has managed to uh, beat the Australian uh, Wi-Fi system and uh, come back to us. So, Tanya, you have, um, you're one of our panelists. Thank you so much. You're, you're um, from the Griffith Asia Institute, and um, I wonder if you could give us uh, f your, your five minutes on uh, this whole issue. And I'm um, just delighted you could be back. It's such a relief. Thanks, Patricia. And sorry about that. My whole computer crashed. Everything just crashed while Tong was speaking. So I've missed a lot. But um, I tried dialing in on the phone and various things, but let's not go into that. Let's just well, get let's, on with this. Let's get on with this. Um, Tanya, so 
Go ahead. Thank you. So I, um, I contributed to the report that we're discussing um, that Chatham House has launched and uh, my chapter or rather short essay examined nuclear deterrence from Australia's perspective um, and at the time that I wrote it um, uh, there was a lot of interest in the newly minted treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and people were talking about how you could might maybe get resistant states to sign up to the treaty and the hope was that well hope depending on what your perspective is on this the hope was that the non-nuclear weapon states including Australia might be losing their faith in nuclear assurances and might actually see the TPNW as a as, as a way forward. Um, and so in my chapter, I, I explained while faith in extended deterrence is getting shakier in Australia, belief in nuclear deterrence and deterrence in general is not. Um, and as far as the ban treaty is concerned, Australia isn't low hanging fruit at all. Um, here, belief in the conflict prevention role of nuclear deterrence is deeply embedded in Canberra's strategic outlook. Um, the defense community regards nuclear deterrence as fundamentally stabilizing and remains committed to it despite growing uncertainties over how nuclear dangers can be managed and despite growing doubts over US alliance resolve. So you might think, well, that sounds irrational. But actually, if you, uh, if you look at decades of Australian defense decision making and realize how deeply mil militarily dependent Australia is on the US and how that dependency is very, very difficult to reverse now, um, uh, you can understand it a little bit better also, if you understand that Australia's defence potency, conventional as well, would plummet uh, without US military, the US military allowance, alliance, it, it makes it, um, it makes more sense. So, um, if you look through 25 years of defence white papers, you can see it all set out very clearly. Um, that said, if I wrote this same paper now, two years on from when I wrote, wrote it, it, there would be some interesting differences. Um, and I would argue, yes, Australia is now seeking new ways to address its defence and security needs as its strategic neighbourhood evolves. And I would say, in this very dynamic situation we're in now, the trend is towards embedding Australia even more deeply into the Indo-Pacific deterrence landscape. Um, so the thrust of last month's defence strategic update, which sets out the government's plan to buy long range uh, missiles from the US and then develop Australia's own advanced strike capabilities, including potentially hypersonic weapons, um, that fits within that sort of new emerging deterrence landscape as Australia, uh, as Canberra sees it. And that, that sounds might sound quite overly ambitious, uh, but Australia and the US were engaged in 10 years of quite close hypersonics cooperation, probably not as ambitious as it sounds. Um, also, now I would say it's hard to avoid the conclusion that if conditions in the region continue to worsen, that Australia is hard to completely rule out Australia seeking greater certainty by developing its own nuclear weapons. And I would not have said that two years ago. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you can see the, the, the strategic debate going on in Canberra. It's been going on uh, for a couple of years, getting a little louder. And former defence officials have actually concluded Australia should at least explore the lead time on developing its own nuclear weapons capability. Um, and it is not a complete pipe dream because Australia has many of the components that would make it possible to go down that road. Now, going back to Chatham House essays, I would say they provide a very good insight into why it would be a big mistake for Australia to take that road. Um, and also, I think if you read the Chatham House report very carefully, or rather this collection of essays, you can see that Australia's current trajectory on the conventional side and in, in, in getting into the region's missile race, I think is also potentially a strategic mistake. But at the same time, it's not a black and white situation. And I think another thing that the essays do is that they provide context for the dilemmas facing today's strategic decision makers. Um, and the reasons, there are so many reasons to worry about the evolving strategic environment. So many questions about how to maintain stability in this emerging environment. And I think it's really telling that despite the growing risks of deterrence breakdown, many of which are discussed in that report, Nuclear deterrence is still regarded by many states as the only credible conflict prevention system. Uh, I think that's telling and whether or not we agree with that, and I don't agree with it, the, its prevalence says something about the security institutions we've created 
and not created to provide alternatives. So we haven't fostered enough trust and confidence through the systems that we have. We haven't dealt with the hard cases convincingly. We haven't adapted the institutions. Um, and moreover, in this region, there are glaring gaps where institutions don't even exist. So if you are sitting in Canberra and you've had decades of money invested in the rules, you know, contributing to the rules-based order, seeing your security as being provided for by the rules-based order and the US Alliance system, you might start wondering whether you, your, your investments have been rather shaky. So I, I, I can just conclude by saying, well, where does that leave us? It leaves us in to f having to face a, a really awful reality that nuclear deterrence is becoming a more dominant part of the Indo-Pacific's strategic landscape, despite the growing risks of nuclear war. Um, I would say uh, the trust and confidence are at an all-time low, that the build-up, uh, the missile build-up has begun in earnest in this region, and the future breakout of states that have relied on extended deterrence is a, is a, a growing possibility. Um, and so I think rather than sit back and be fatalistic about this, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, we've got to really work hard on preventing deterrence breakdown, those who can. That is going to be a focus, risk reduction, preventing deterrence breakdown, revitalizing arms control, adapting it to today's world, and, and then reinforcing and really having a very serious discussion about the future of the non-proliferation regime, regime and how we have to strengthen its weaknesses and how we have to plug the gaps in it because they're growing. Um, so I say it's all difficult, but it's all urgent. And I think we have to be proactive about doing these things and taking it really seriously. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I, th I think that was a really, really important contribution to this discussion. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the time. I'm aware that we have uh, fewer than um, 10 minutes left, uh, six minutes actually. Um, and there are a number of questions coming up. Um, one, uh, one set of questions refers to uh, the role of China in this. Another set of questions looks very much at the conundrum that's being posed by new low yield some might say more usable weapons, um, new tech, emerging technologies and their impact on nuclear deterrence equations is, is coming into this. And also, you know, what can be done in terms of confidence building measures, the MPT, et cetera. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn to um, Ambassador Nobuyasu Abe, and, and I know he has a couple of questions and ask him to keep them very short, I hope. Um, and then um, I think you can all read in the Q&A the, the excellent questions that have, have come up, most of which I think seem to want to ask me to read them out. And, and rather than do that, I think what I'll do is I'll just ask each of you to choose one of those questions to answer um, and um, do your best in the final round in order that we can end more or less on time. So um, Ambassador Abe, if you would be so kind. Thank you. Thank you. I'll skip the first question about the MPT, the future, because I'm writing a, paper, a piece of paper and that will tell my answers to the question. I would like to put the question to uh, Dr. Ton Cao about the possible contributions China can make to encourage the United States and Russia to go further in their nuclear weapons reduction. It's a, a very polite way to ask uh, if China can join the arms control, nuclear arms control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there were um, other questions about China's, China's role as well and what China could do. So perhaps, um, Tong Zhao, if we could begin with you and you could address those. Thank you so much. Um, I think what China can do first uh, is to pro provide uh, better nuclear transparency. Um, China is less dependent today than before on um, uh, numerical ambiguity about its nuclear forces for, uh, for credible deterrence, which means China should be able uh, to offer greater transparency on the overall size of its nuclear weapons. Uh, and secondly, on terms, in terms of transparency, China can uh, better clarify um, the nature of some of its missile systems. Are they nuclear only, conventional only, or nuclear conventional deal capable? That clarification can help reduce risk of inadvertent escalation. And uh, to connect with the point of no first use, which China wants to promote, um, 
the re one important reason the U.S. is reluctant to adopt no first use is because of uh, concerns from American allies, including uh, East Asian allies like Japan, uh, which worries about China's uh, China's uh, military power in the region. So, in return, uh, you know, so for China to uh, pr to encourage U.S. to uh, adopt a sole purpose or no first use, I think China can offer. Uh, some uh, strategic reassurance to American allies, uh, especially by uh, uh, explicitly uh, um, giving up uh, the military option of resolving territorial disputes uh, near China. I think that would be really helpful uh, to resolve this uh, dilemma and also help achieve new, uh, no first use agreement that China wants to see. Last point, uh, China's role in, in new future nuclear arms control to focus exclusively on nuclear issue, I think is a little problematic because many concerns are about non-nuclear uh, strategic weapon systems. And if we broaden the scope, we will see that there are many innovative ways to combine nuclear and non-nuclear strategic capabilities together and, and then offer an equal platform for all the major powers to participate as, as equal partners. One way to do so is to combine um, uh, strategic nuclear weapons with uh, theater range and missile systems. Uh, US, Russia have advantage in the former category of weapons, but China has advantage in the latter category. Combine these two categories of weapons would be a, an easy way for the three powers to, to do arms control as equal partners. So I will stop here, thanks. Thank you very much. Nikolai, if I could turn to you very briefly, I know you've given a long answer to a previous set of questions, but if you could just uh, address the new start um, uh, discussions for the extension and where you see that going, that came in from Elena Guy of Vertic. I'm sorry, the extension? The, uh, sorry, the extension of the new start treaty. Or uh, new, new negotiations, uh, which are in Vienna at the moment, or have been recently, I should say. Oh uh, yes. Uh, well, I think the extension of New Start is a purely political decision that should be made by the Trump administration, uh, and I think they're just really using it for tactical purposes. Uh, well, at the ongoing consultations, I think the chances are 50-50 uh that the trump administration will extend it if not i hope that the biden administration can do that oh oh there's absolutely no reason on on not to extend new start uh one thing that we should do oh yes and that's what we did not do oh in the previous 10 years uh new start was intended as a step as a vehicle to buy time to provide stability uh, to negotiate a new generation treaty. Yes, and we did not manage to do that in the last 10 years. And I think it's really vital uh, that if we can extend a new start, uh, we do use the remaining five years uh, to finally start serious negotiations. We need to understand uh, that the existing arms control frameworks are outdated. Uh, we do uh, need to change the framework and first and foremost uh, we do need to switch accounting uh, uh, from delivery uh, uh, from delivery vehicles uh, to actual nuclear weapons uh, we do keep forgetting that arms control agreements do not in fact address nuclear weapons themselves so we need to do that it's not easy uh, uh, that's quite controversial it's even painful uh, but we need to do that and we should not oh, waste any more time. We already wasted 10 years. I hope that we have another five years uh, because conducting uh, negotiations of, in the absence of, of any treaties is so much more difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, Jessica, um, there's been talk of emerging tech, there's uh, low yield, uh, low threshold weapons. Um, you take your pick. Sure. Um, well, I'll start because I didn't have an opportunity to answer the no first use questions uh, earlier. Uh, I'm going to pass on talking about what a potential Biden administration would potentially do. That's not in my job jar anymore. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on the NATO aspect of it. Um, 
you know, from a from a NATO perspective, I think it'll be uh, very hard to convince allies that the time is right now to have a, a no first use posture. I, I think that the the um, erosion of some of the uh, transatlantic links throughout the last few years um, will make uh, you know kind of no first use proposals even less appealing than they were four years ago um, when the Obama administration looked at this. Um, and so I, I, I don't think that that is um, likely to be, a, to be an outcome in the near term. But, but again, I, I, from a NATO perspective, I, I think it's quite, it's quite unlikely. Um, that said, uh, you know, I, no first use policies are, are only as good as, uh, you know, the confidence people have in them, their political statements. And, and I think that, the, that there's many, many more things that we need to be discussing. I think Dr. Sokov just outlined many of them. Uh, that would be, you know, more stabilizing and, and more helpful in the long run than than, a, than focusing on on no first use. Um, I, I think that there's way too much uh, mistrust in the system right now, particularly between the United States and Russia. I don't think that that's going to change um, if a Biden administration comes in. Uh, if anything, um, you know, people coming, the people that will come into a Biden administration were the ones that were. Uh, you know, the, they have the legacy of um, the Ukraine crisis and things like that. Uh, so it's not going to be a wholesale new group of folks coming in. So I, I don't think that um, kind of focusing on new, new first use is where we should be. I think the, the strategic stability talks that are ongoing right now um, are, are really positive, the, the signs coming out. Uh, I think we need to do a lot of work just leveling the playing fields. Tom Zhao spoke about this as well. Um, really getting to some of these misperceptions between uh, between all the all the nations involved, um, I think is 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 the starting point that, that we need to that we need to, to to have and and really kind of big bold steps are probably not likely to to um, be forthcoming in in the next few years, and I think that's okay. We have a lot of work that we need to do. Uh, and I, I agree with Dr. Sokov that there is not enough dialogue. Um, the NATO has been asking for a new NATO Russia, uh, a new NATO Russia Council meeting. Uh, I think that there's um, been some discussions about when that would potentially happen or not. Um, we need to use that as a forum for talking as well as the strategic stability talks. Um, you know, China needs to be part of the discussion as well, whether it's in a trilateral forum or otherwise. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot more dialogue that, that needs to happen, uh, and a lot of a, there's just so much mistrust um, throughout the system. Um, on emerging tech, I can just say a couple of things. Uh, you know, the the comment about the the um, relationship between non-nuclear strategic capabilities and nuclear strategic capabilities has already been raised. I think that this is clearly an area that we need to look at for future arms control. We have to start thinking about arms control in, in, in new ways. Um, looking at parity between numbers is just not going to get us very far, uh, particularly with the things that concern us now from a European perspective. A lot of that is, is non-strategic nuclear systems or strategic conventional systems. I mean, that's, that's really where, where we see um, the concerns. I think strategic parity between the US and Russia is good and certainly from a um, NATO allies, uh, I think the vast majority have been very clear that they wanna see new start extended, but that's just a starting point. And we really have to start thinking um, about the security landscape uh, much more comprehensively uh, than we have in the past. And, and I agree 100% with Dr. Sokal, we have to think about it in new ways and, and think about the future realistically um, and uh, and and the, and think about and be more creative in in how we develop solutions because I think the the models that we've relied on in the past are, are just they're not going to be effective in the future. Um, and then on low yield, just very quickly um, from a NATO perspective, you know I think NATO has been supportive of U.S. development of. Um, of a small number of low yield systems. 
as a way to have a, a range of options on the escalation ladder. Uh, NATO is concerned about uh, Russia's development of low yield systems in a much more robust way or non-strategic systems in a much more um, robust way. Uh, I do think that um, you know, we see, the, we see the US systems um, and NATO's own uh, B61 systems uh, as helpful options to have. So you don't just have to jump, <laughs> you don't have a decision between a strategic nuclear response or nothing. Um, so I, you know, I think we see this as a, as a, as a stabilizing force. That said, you know, certainly we don't want to see uh, the proliferation of, of tons of low yield systems. Um, and I think that, again, from a NATO perspective, you're increasingly concerned about Russia's dual use systems and their dual yield systems um, that range the European theater as, as really part of something that's quite destabilizing for the region. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. I'm very aware of the time. We have gone over time, but I do want to go back to Tanya Ogilvy-White for a few remarks because she hasn't been able to participate. And um, I think um, what we'd like to hear, Tanya, from everything you've heard so far and seen questions, whether we could um, think constructively about uh, what we might do to go forward, taking what uh, Nikolai has said, what Tang Zhou has said, and what Jessica has just said. Yes, well, uh, I do. I have uh, two priorities as I see it. I think we need um, a dialogue on doctrine, a dialogue on doctrine and technology, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically to increase transparency and to increase communication on, you know, where in order for deterrence to work and in order to prevent deterrence breaking down, we need to understand where red lines are. We need to understand how states expect to respond and how to react in certain scenarios. So I think that that sort of dialogue on doctrine um, would be a number one. One way to do it would be to get um, the nuclear armed states, uh, all of them, um, together uh, under an expanded P5 type process. I'd like to see something like that. Um, the other thing I'd like to see is a formal arms control effort for um, the Asia Pacific region. So countries coming together to talk about um, not just nuclear arms control, but uh, you know, including conventional as well, um, and trying to really nut out some ideas for some. Um, you know, some, some discussion that will actually lead to some stability and some sense of stability. And within that, also looking at the non-proliferation regime as it is at the moment and ways that we can strengthen it and ways that we can bring discussion of new technology, technological developments into those discussions as well. So um, that's what I'd like to see. And I think that would bring some transparency and some clarity and it might actually build some confidence as well. Uh, because I think a lot of what's going on at the moment is this huge amount of uncertainty and that uncertainty is really driving insecurity and learn and leading to worst case scenario um, thinking and falling back on old solutions which might are not relevant anymore or are more dangerous today is the way I'd say, say it. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks Patricia. That was a very good note on which to end. Um, I recognize that we probably should have put two hours in for this discussion. Um, always leave them wanting more is a good mantra I think that most comedians uh, uh, rely on. So I'm not saying that any of us are that, but I think it's a, it's a, a certainly we need a, a sort of rematch. I think there are, this has been a discussion that has given us a lot of material to think about. Uh, there's some really good proposals, some great analysis. I want to thank all of our uh, participants. I want to thank uh, Governor Yuzaki very much uh, for coming in from the Hiroshima Prefecture um, and bringing that perspective in at the beginning. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for uh, contributing uh, what is actually a very wide array of views. But in the end, I think with a lot of uh, common agreement on the ways forward and the ways to think about it. And I think that has been very constructive. I'd also like to thank everybody um, who is uh, participating um, and for the questions that you've put forward in the q and I am aware that we didn't answer really uh, questions on the India-Pakistan issue. And uh, I think that is a subject for another uh, webinar that we should be doing because I think it's a really important one. Um, and uh, thanks uh, to everybody for uh, participating in the way that they have. And thank you so much to uh, Chatham House's uh, membership team 
uh, for put, helping us put this on. And what I hope is the beginning of several of these types of webinars coming forward for our um, centenary uh, that we uh, began celebrating in July this year. So uh, thank you all very much. Um, I hope you all got as much out of it as I did. As I said, we have recorded it. It will uh, go online and uh, you can uh, listen to it again if you missed anything. So thank you all.